What do you know about Pentecost? Well, you should know a lot about Pentecost. If you're a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, and particularly if you're watching for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, Pentecost has got to be the best study in the Bible. And I have a man here who has written <clears throat> The Pentecostal Rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ. His name is Jack Langford. And your book is an exciting book to me. And I, I, it's a pleasure having you here today. Well, thank the Lord for the truth that is represented there and that God was enabling me and others to see and to put in printing uh, for Christians. Uh, Pentecost, of course, is a Jewish feast day. It's the Greek word for 50. That was one of the names. Pentecost had about six na different names for it. Originally, it was a harvest feast. And then it became the first fruit harvest feast. And it was preceded during the Feast of Unleavened Bread by a priest going out into the temple after the first Sabbath that occurred during the Feast of Unleavened Bread and waving a handful of grain, which was this sample of the harvest to come. And also a guarantee of the harvest to come. Mm-hmm. That was a wave sheaf offering during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They counted 50 days, and at the 50th day they celebrated the first spring harvest. And that eventually came to be called Pentecost, 50th. 50, and by the way it's a Greek way of saying 50. Pentecosti just simply means 50. And uh, I have my Bible open to Leviticus 13, uh, the, uh, the feasts, uh, the, the, the layout of the feasts of Israel. And it just says, you shall count uh, uh, unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Now that's seven times seven is 49 days. Right. And so now we're on the verge of the 50th day. Right. And what happens on the 50th day? Well, in the book of Acts, the second chapter, it says, when the day of Pentecost was plumeru, <laughs> was fully come. Fully come. It means it's to fill to the full, literally. And it wasn't just on the 24-hour period. It was at the precise time when they were waving up the two loaves of bread in the air, just in the same manner as they had waved up the sample of grain 50 days earlier. And we know by the Apostle Paul's revelation given to us that the waving of the grain symbolized the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful, beautiful truth. But in his resurrection, he becomes the guarantee for the whole harvest to come. And it was celebrated 50 days later. Now the church was born on that day. That's when it came into existence. Mm. Which we can say, well, if the waving in the air of the handful of grain symbolized Christ's resurrection and ascension to the Father, then what does the waving of the two loaves of bread symbolize? But the offering of the whole harvest to God, its resurrection and ascension to the Father in the air. So when we study the subject, we learn that there's a correlation between the truth of the rapture of the church and the day of Pentecost. It's a beautiful thing. It was hidden in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. They didn't realize it. It didn't come too late to, to, to everybody's consciousness until the church was there, and then they could look back and see a mystery opened up. Well, after the uh, 49th day, uh, uh, the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, uh, 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 you shall number 50 days, and you shall offer a new meat offering to the Lord. You shall bring out of your hab habitations two wave loaves of two-tenth deals. Uh, they shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now, they have leaven. these loaves are leavened bread. And 
we think of, of uh, uh, the bread that, w that was used at that time, for, particularly for ceremonial purposes, and it was unleavened bread and for the most part. But this is deliberately called out as leavened bread. Mm -hmm. Why? Very significant. All the bread that part of it would be burnt on the altar had to be unleavened bread. Unleavened bread was called the, the bread of sacrifice, the bread of their labor, the hardships there. Whereas leavened bread was mm, real good. They yeah. made cakes of it and good fresh bread. And it's only used twice in the sacrificial system. First, for, for the Feast of Pentecost, make two loaves of bread to be offered to God. But then in the middle sacrifice, now the, the, there were seven ma basic sacrifices. The burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering. Well the peace offering if it, in Leviticus 7, if it was to be offered in thanksgiving, then have, un, have leaven cakes in it. Hmm. So there, leaven is connected with the idea of thanksgiving. It's good and wholesome. It is a fact that we normally think of leaven as being corruption. But it's not always that way. As it is here, it means it's thanksgiving. And I have to believe that that's a part, a very vital part of the, these two loaves of bread. It represents thanksgiving to God. Now, it's a long way from Leviticus 23 to the title of Jack's book, The Pentecostal Rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, Pentecost, 50, and, and that number is, uh, represents a kind of maturing period. But it also is an actual number that was fulfilled to the very moment right. in the New Testament. Right. And we, we think of uh, Jesus meeting with the disciples, book of Acts, and, uh, and telling that it had been about 40 days. And he is lifted into the heavens and they watch him go and then they go about their business. And then the story gets interesting. Then the story gets interesting. Ten days after, of course, the Holy Spirit come. But before Christ went up, he told the apostles that they're to stay in Jerusalem until they are endued with power from on high. The Holy Spirit will come upon them. A new age actually will begin. And then you have to preach the Word of God here in Judea and Jerusalem and around about and all over the world. It's going to extend out this message. In other words, the Wave sheaf offering was a type of the first grain to be ripened and Christ's resurrection. Then the feast celebrates the, the harvest and the ripening of the whole field of grain. Now, God's planting a field in this age. That's one of the things God's doing. And lo and behold, who are the main occupants in that field? Well, it's the world, the Gentile world. And Pentecost was also related to, in fact, my wife and I went over to Jerusalem, 1989, and the ritual of Pentecost then, they would read the book of Ruth during the Feast of Pentecost. Why? Because the story is the setting of the day of Pentecost. In other words, the setting and it begins the whole harvest season. So it starts off with this Gentile woman, Ruth who came to trust under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty, the God of Israel. A beautiful, beautiful love story. And finally at the fine celebration of the harvest, she presents herself to Boaz, the mighty man of wealth, and claims a kinsman redeemership. So the Jews read that book. Gentiles are connected with Pentecost. Now what is God doing today? Now we might be looking around and saying, well, with this disease flying around, I don't know what God's doing. But <laughs> <laughs> we're scared and we're huddling in, huddling in our houses. But let me say, God is doing this day the same thing He began on the day of Pentecost. He began to build His church. And He began to call out people. Mm. Now the book of Acts records the fact that the Message went out now to Gentiles. And the first ones that were Gentiles who got saved were 
under Peter's ministry. That was to help the apostles understand that God is going a new direction. There's a transition in Acts. And James, the Lord's brother, says, Simon has declared how that God at first is visiting the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Wow. Mm. Beautiful. After this, the prophet said, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. In other words, after this outcalling of Gentiles, God will return and start his program anew with Israel. And of course, there in the audience at that first conference was the apostle to the Gentiles, who said, likewise, he told King Agrippa, God has called me to go to the Gentile peoples, to take them out from under the hands of Lucifer, Satan, from out of the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, where they'll have the remission of sins and they can glorify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this age and this harvest field now is primarily composed of Gentile peoples. Amazing and beautiful as it is. I'm holding up my Bible and looking at Acts uh, 1 and 2 which is an amazing story uh, every time I read this. And uh, you, you come to Acts 2 and it talks about the, how the, the uh, uh, disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and what happened. And, and there is this telltale phrase, and I think you mentioned it a minute ago, uh, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all uh, with one accord in one place. And the idea of being fully come uh, I was amazed to discover years ago that the Jews celebrate Pentecost by staying up all night mm -hmm. and reading their prayer books. Right. And the, they, uh, they read what they call uh, texts for the decoration of the bride. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? And they stay up all night, the sun comes up the next morning and they, get, they, they emerge from their homes confident that at some time during the night the heavens open for just a brief moment mm. and they received a, if you will, a leading from the Lord. Mm. So, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, that happened to the uh, disciples, except it really happened to them. That is to say, uh, they did become the bride, and rather quickly too. And 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 the next morning, they at sunrise they they ran out of the uh, the rooms and and they praised the Lord in the streets of Jerusalem. Well, it's it's beautiful that we realize, therefore, that the day of Pentecost was vitally connected with this age and what God is doing in this age of time, because. It was born at the very moment the priests were in the temple waving up the two loaves of bread in the celebration of the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. About 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven and a rushing mighty wind. And the Holy Spirit fell upon all the disciples who were gathered there with the physical phenomena taking place in there, signifying that the Holy Spirit has taken up His residence on this earth in the hearts and lives of every blood-bought believer. Now, beautiful. Yeah. And this is a harvest field. Now, in the book of Romans, chapter 8, Paul connects that not only with the resurrection of Christ, but with the resurrection of the first fruit harvest. Beautiful. Christ the first fruits. That's right. After that, those that are his it is coming. Right. Now I've got I'm going to ask you a question. Here we get to to, to the, the really interesting part. The book is the Pentecostal Rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, we're all looking for the rapture of the church, uh, the pre-tribulational rapture of the church, and we haven't set a date for the rapture, by the way, but we think it could be any moment. Mm -hmm. How do you link, as you do in your book, go the rest of the way now and tell us how you link all of the things that we've talked about with the rapture of the church? Well, first of all, God makes the link. God makes the connection for us. So it's not some arbitrary decision or illusion by us. On two occasions, Paul links the saints with first fruits. 
the idea of the first root harvest, mm -hmm. and he specifies that deal. So we know, therefore, that the church was born on that day, but the significance of that day actually had to do with our conclusion, our resurrection and ascension. So it's a day that covers this whole age right now today. And the number 50 really meant that. Completion. Mm -hmm. Fullness. Yeah. 50 is not symbolic of 50. 50 is symbolic of fullness. Completion. When the age is completed. Well, when that time comes, and God knows when that time comes, then the church will go up. Remember, James says... God is now beginning to call out from among the Gentiles. When that is completed, he'll start his other program. In chapter 11 of Romans, Paul says, when the fullness, plero, that Greek word, mm -hmm. fullness, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes, then we'll go up and all Israel will turn to the Lord. And in other words, that's one indication that the rapture of the church will be influential in the conversion, probably in two stages, of the Jewish people. First, a remnant who will go into the Great Tribulation period, and then the final salvation of the whole family of Israel. It's a beautiful use. We know that Paul gives indication of that, and, and uh, maybe a little later I could refer to that indication in the book of Romans. But in Romans chapter 8, and what chapter is that? Well, you talk about important chapters in the Bible. Yeah. Romans 8 is the pinnacle of truth in the whole book of Romans. 16 chapters, that 8th chapter. It is the conquering, glorious chapter of our future and our goal. In Romans 8, verses uh, 11, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Okay? The Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead. Christ helped him. <laughs> Christ yeah. was the energy. The Spirit was the energy. Christ was the worker. God authored it. All three were involved in it. But that same Holy Spirit dwells in every blood-bought believer and has guaranteed the same thing will happen to us. Now, over in verse 22 Paul, and 23, Paul says, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Ah, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, Christ is the first fruit sample of those who will be raised. And that meant those who will be raised will be the first fruit harvest. And here he says, the Spirit that raised Christ, first fruit, sample, is going to be in us to raise us. First fruit harvest. The first fruits of the Spirit. We're the antitypical Pentecostal offering to God. Going all we the way back right. to, to where we started. Right back to where you started. The whole, uh, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Thank God. And the glorious truth in chapter 8 is that we don't have to worry about what the world is doing in its climactic perversions today. In the medical realm, scientific realm, they could twist genomes around and so forth. You can't twist the genome of our new nature around. That's, that's true. untouchable. And that's the guarantee that we're having that we're going up regardless of which way the world goes. The church is going to go up when the time of the Gentiles is completed. And that, of course, is what Pentecost symbolized in its ritual. And he takes that up in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the three orders of the resurrection of the righteous. Christ of first fruits, they that are Christ. Now that terminology means they that are the first root harvest. They that are Christ. He symbolized the first root harvest. Mm -hmm. then we're next, and then after that, all the Old Testament saints, then the end, when he will harvest. Well, the final feast was the final ingathering of harvest. And so the three feasts, again, 
is God's timetable, almost like a dispensation chart of when he's going to be raising all the righteous to first resurrection. Christ, the first fruit, then they that are Christ that is coming, the church, then the final harvest. The, all the Old Testament tribulation saints will complete the first resurrection of the righteous on earth. So the Bible gives a complete picture. Therefore, Pentecost becomes a beautiful day. It's like a banner we wave today of mm-hmm. joy. The more we learn about it, and there's been a lot of ignorance about it, the more we learn about the characteristics of that day, the more we can see beautiful truth that enriches our life and makes it steadfast for us to serve Christ. Like I say, we know what God's purpose is. He's calling out a people from among the Gentiles for his name. Now, what's our purpose? in being here. In Romans 12, we get it. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In that way, we glorify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's calling us out to bring honor to His name, to His glory. My wife and I just finished reading some of the preliminary stories about King David. And God reminded him, David, I chose you to lead my people, Israel. Mm. Wow. Israel was a special package, a special group of people through whom God was manifesting His will to be a testimony to the world. And the church today is the same special people who are chosen by God to manifest the name of the Lord to the world by our conduct, by being transformed. Don't follow the patterns of the world in every area of life. The last chapters of the Romans are practical exhortations for everyday Christian living. And it's exciting to read it that our lives are changed and we can put on the new man, we can walk in Christ Mm. Jesus in everyday practical godliness. You know, the the verse that Jack just read, really, I was thinking in my mind about all the things we see on television or on the street. Uh, This verse too says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, That really has a lot of currency. Oh, when you look at what's happened to society uh, today, mm. or in the last 50 years, yes, and you, you and I happen to have white hair, so we've looked at the last 50 years, and we have seen what's happened, in spite of a lot of great preaching in the last 50 years. Society has backslidden. Oh my. And it says, be not conformed to this world. Oh my. That, is, that says a lot to me right now. One day I was preaching in Lima, Peru, in the park. This was about 1980. And when we flew into Lima at that time, we noticed a Russian airplane, big plane, had parked ahead of us, and they were unloading. A lot of Russians coming in. Peru had made a league with the Russians at that time. Russia got the rights to fish, and boy, they they stripped the, the ocean bare in front of Peru. And the Peruvians got airplanes and MiGs and jets and pilots. Well, we were preaching in the park, and we had quite a crowd of people listening. And I was using a translator. And two guys walked up and kind of wedged their way through the crowd to listen. I was giving the truths about Jesus Christ. And one of them started speaking right quick. And my translator kind of froze. And I said, hey, what's he saying? What's he saying? He said, they're Russian. And they're telling the people, don't listen to this guy. He's just a CIA agent telling you about democracy. You need communism. That's what you folks need. Well, when this guy finished, I said, let me tell you folks, I'm not a CIA agent. And I don't have anything against communism. I think it's great. In fact, the only people who could practice it were the early Christians. Because they weren't selfish. What the Soviet Union forgot is that Man by nature is essentially selfish, and only a few people get a lot, and the other people get nothing. So it won't work. Nor am I trying to advocate democracy. The reason the world chooses democracy is because they can't trust a dictator anymore. But 
a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Hey, that's pretty good stuff. But I'm not advocating that. What if the people become corrupt? Then you have a corruption. I'm advocating Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can give peace to the human heart and to this world today. And those Russians turned around and walked away. Wow. What could they say after And my, I'm sad to say our society, my dear Christian brethren, our American society is becoming corrupt. So, no, I'm not advocating for the right political party. I'm advocating for trusting Jesus Christ and following this, being an example in our new Christian life. You know, the, the, the book title is The Pentecostal Rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ, and we barely touched all of, of the interesting points that you make and connections, the, the things that you don't even think about. Uh, what's the real purpose, the Feast of Pentecost? Uh, uh, what's the calendar of Israel and how, how is it prophetic? And it really is. And, uh, and Jack goes into the details uh, in this book, The Pentecostal Rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ. And it is, in my opinion, if you're interested at all in Bible prophecy, this has got to be one of the top books on your bookshelf. Pentecostal Rapture of the Church, yours for a gift of $20, shipping included, free anywhere in the United States. And by the way, uh, we put things together in packages. And uh, I have uh, four books by Jack Langford. Uh, not only the Pentecostal Rapture, but the threefold order of the resurrection of the righteous. And this will enable you to go and preach to your friends. That's all I've got to say. If you know what's in this book, uh, you're, you're going to go out and tell people what you just read. I guarantee it. It's it, because... It's simple, it's beautiful, and it is wonderfully appropriate for today. The, the Gap is Not a Theory, by the way, uh, speaks about Jack's uh, examination of the first uh, couple of verses in Genesis. And uh, by the way, that's a hot topic these days. And the fire that is eternal, exploring the nature of man and the reality of hell. And hell is real, and as much as it pains us to say so, you have to study about it. Because you need a little bit of, uh, shall we say, a little nudge to go in the right direction. And when you read about uh, hell, you'll have that nudge, believe me. Uh, we have the Rapture and Resurrection Package, Jack's four books, plus uh, The Order of the Resurrections, Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy and the Key Ideas Bible Handbook. Uh, Jack's four books, three free bonuses for a gift of $75, shipping included anywhere in the United States. And let me tell you, there's so much great information here. You need to avail yourself of it. Jack, it's been great talking with you, and uh, we are going to talk again. Good. So, and with, there's a lot more to talk about. His name is Jack Langford. You need to read his books. I'm Gary Stearman. Hey, you keep watching. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.